Are you satisfied with your experience? Can you hear me? Yes. Maybe a little bit louder? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Maybe go up. Okay. Are you satisfied with your experience? You can be, and you should be, if you are not. Who could be better than Jesus? Who could be better than Jesus? It seems that no one could be. But Jesus, the night before he went to the cross, said to his disciples, I'm going to go away, and it's a good thing that I'm going to go away. Because if I don't go away, I cannot send the Holy Spirit. And when He comes, in effect, Jesus said, He is going to be better for you. His presence with you and in you is going to be better for you than my presence with you. How can that be? How can that be? And yet, Jesus promised, I will send the Holy Spirit. He is an advocate a comforter, an encourager, a counselor, a helper. John 16, 5 through 7. I'm going away to the one who sent me. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. John 15, 26. But I will send you the advocate, he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. The work of the Holy Spirit is to lift up Jesus. The work of the Holy Spirit is to let us know this is what Jesus is like. The work of the Holy Spirit is not to glorify man. Primar it is not to glorify man. The work of the Holy Spirit is not primarily so that we can do this or we can do that. The work of the Holy Spirit is to show and to reveal Jesus to us. Jesus to us. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, in agreement, in agreement, said, the Holy Spirit would be the one into whose hands the church would be given. He's the one responsible for you and for me. He's the one responsible to make us like Jesus. He's the one responsible to empower and to equip us and to, to do the work that God has called us to do. He's the one responsible for giving us new life. John 3, 5 through 7. Are you satisfied with your experience? Have you been born again? John 3, 5 through 7. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. So Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, but it's the work of the Spirit who applies what Jesus did for us on the cross and brings the life of Christ and the life of God into our lives. Humans can reproduce only human life. Churches can do good things, but they can't give you life. Good people can help you, but they can't give you life. Only the Holy Spirit can give you life. And Jesus said, so don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Not a denomination, not a church group, is what Jesus said. You must be born again, and the Holy Spirit does that. What else does the Holy Spirit do? Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Acts 2, 38 and 39. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The baptism with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And on that Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit was first poured out in a new way, in a new dimension, in the lives and the hearts of people, and there were these wonderful manifestations. And then the people, as Peter and the disciples began to preach, the people were so confused convicted of their sin. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said when He comes, He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So those of you in EE, Evangelism Explosion, you trainers, and those of you that are learning and are going out, as you go out and you share with people, and even the rest of you, even, even if you're not part of the evangelism training, but you're talking with people, or you're talking with your families about Jesus, I want to tell you something. It is not 
your work or your job to convict them of sin. If you try to do that, you will just make people mad. And they will reject. Everybody say yes, because you tried it before, right? Yes. That's right. You'll make them mad, and they'll reject you, and they won't want to listen to what you have to say. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And you say, well, you mean I shouldn't study? Yes, you should study. I shouldn't learn the two questions? Yes, learn the two questions. I shouldn't prepare myself? Yes, prepare yourself. But all of these things are tools tools only. It is the Holy Spirit that takes you and your preparation and those tools and then He does the work that only He can do. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in you and through you, not just by what you say, but by how you live. And how you live will speak louder than anything your mouth can ever say. And so you let the Holy Spirit work in you, and He does His work. And on that first day of Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit was poured out initially for the first time in a wonderful new dimension, the people responded, what shall we do? Because the Holy Spirit was doing His work, right? He was convicting them. And Peter says, you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. By the way, when he says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, understand something. Because some, some people will say, okay, so I should be baptized only in the name of Jesus. That's not what Peter was saying here. Peter was talking to a group because Jesus had said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. Do you think Peter 45 or just if not, not many days, 50 days after Jesus goes back to heaven, do you think Peter's going to come up with his own doctrine? Let's do it this way instead? Of course not. But what he was doing was addressing a crowd that had rejected Jesus. And so what Peter was saying was, the one that you rejected, you have to accept him. And that's the point he's making there. He says, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is, for, is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is a gift from God the Father and God the Son, not just for the early church 2,000 years ago. We need the gift of the Holy Spirit as much today as anyone has ever needed it, just as much as the early disciples, just as much as the early church. We need the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we have been promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have been promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, it's to you. It's to your children and even to the Gentiles. How many of you this morning are Gentiles? Yes or no? You say, no, 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 I'm Filipino. No, you're a Gentile, okay? I'm American. No, you're a Gentile. In other words, you are a non-Jew this morning. I don't know. Do we have any Jews in the church this morning? I don't think so. Or maybe some, some of you here are one thirty-second or one whatever. Who knows? But the promise is for everyone uh, that, uh, on whom God calls. And He has called us. And so I want to ask you, are you satisfied with your experience? Are you satisfied? If not, you can be. You should be. All oh, the gifts of God, they satisfy our hearts. The gifts of God, they fill our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. And then we go beyond that. And I want to ask you, are you satisfied with your experience? Ephesians 4, 21 through 23. The Holy Spirit is given to you and to me in our everyday lives. I love the I love the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I do. I do. I'm so thankful that I have received that gift and that the Holy Spirit is active in my life in that dimension and in my prayer times and in my worship times. But I want to tell you what, if that were to be the only place where I have the gift and the working of the Holy Spirit in my life, I would be done for. 
I would be lost. I wouldn't make it. Why? Because I need the work of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the Holy Spirit in my life every day. I can't make it on my own. I can't live for God on my own. I can't be gentle and loving and kind day after day after day on my own. Oh, I can do it for a little while. I can try really hard and keep my temper and keep kind and keep whatever. But sooner or later, I run to the end of myself. I've got to have the work of the Holy Spirit. You must have the work of the Holy Spirit in your life day by day by day. As you go to your work, at, in your place of business, as you're cleaning homes, as you're teaching in classes, as you're interacting with family and friends, you and I must have the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I ask you this morning, are you satisfied? You can be and you should be because God, the Holy Spirit, has come to be with us and to walk with us and to work in us and to transform us day by day by day. Amen? Amen. 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 God has not said, do it yourself in this world. God has given His Holy Spirit to walk with you day by day by day. This is another work of the Holy Spirit, as essential as every other work of the Holy Spirit. This morning, in the time that we have left, I want to look at one more thing, one more area that the Holy Spirit intersects our lives and does His work. There's an, another area that we don't have time to, we won't have time today to get to, maybe sometime in the future, but there's, a, there's one other aspect that no one here has yet experienced, and that is when the Holy Spirit raises us from the dead should Jesus tarry. And that's pretty exciting. The Bible says a lot about that. The Holy Spirit, it says, the same Spirit that raised Jesus, if He dwells in you, He will quicken your earthly, mortal body. That's going to be the work of the Holy Spirit. And oh, it's going to be exciting one day. But until then, until then, you see God the Holy Spirit works throughout our history through, from beginning to end because He's God because He's God. But there's one other area this morning where God works, God the Holy Spirit works. And I want us to think for just a short while this morning about the places. This was, this was the last one that we looked at. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts. Sorry, I, I, we brought it up and then I didn't read it, did I? But you could see it on the board. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and now the last place, the last thing I want to talk about as in this series is the work of the Holy Spirit in your times of stretching, in your times of crisis. And the Holy Spirit in our crisis times, the Holy Spirit in our stretching times, when we are pulled or stretched beyond our natural ability, when we are stretched beyond our natural capacity, the Holy Spirit is available to you and to me in those times. He is available. Those are special times. Those are not day-to-day -day times. Yes, He's there day-to-day, -day, but I want to talk very specifically about the times when it is more than you can do it is more than you can handle. You heard Pastor Renee talk very briefly about that this morning as they went to Xinjiang. And he was in a situation where he couldn't, he wasn't, although he speaks Chinese well, his capacity, his ability was not enough for the need. The need was greater. And you heard him give testimony about what God did. And that's a wonderful testimony. That's a wonderful example of what we're going to look at this morning. Because this is the testimony of children of God from the beginning when the Holy Spirit was outpoured all the, through, all the way up through today and into the future. I want us this morning to begin with Peter. You know, I, you know how much I love our, my brother Peter. Um, Peter from the Bible. Uh, I love the other Peter as well, but this is the Peter from the uh, Xiaodong, from, from the Bible. And I want us to look at an experience in our lives. And you've heard me 
I, you probably don't remember. Many, many years ago, I talked about the church's first recorded miracle. And it's, it's recorded in Acts 3. There may very well have been other miracles before then, but God the Holy Spirit inspired Acts chapter 3, the first recorded miracle. And this is when Peter and John are walking to the temple one day. And as they walk to the temple, they, at the same time as they walk, oh, by chance? No. When you're a child of God, nothing is by chance. Nothing's by chance. And Peter and John are going to a prayer meeting. You, you said they went to prayer meetings? Yes, that's what the Bible says. They're on their way to a prayer meeting at the temple. And just as they go in, somebody else comes in as well. And it's a, it's a, crippled, it's a crippled beggar who has never walked in his life. And he comes in at the same time. We know the story well. And he asks for money. And Peter and John don't have money. They don't have silver and gold. They have something a whole lot better than silver or gold. They have Jesus. And they, Peter looks at him and he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Mm, wow. And he does. And he does. And he's healed. And the commotion that, that occurs at that point disrupts everything. And this is found in Acts 3. And it spills over into Acts 4. We're going to look at this. And this is something that we're going to see. When God begins to work and when God begins to move, Usually there are two reactions. There will be great rejoicing and great things happening and people, oh, praise God, and great joy. But there will be another reaction very often and it tells us something about our hearts. There will be another reaction often that is, this is so much trouble. What is going on? Why can't things just stay the same? And very often, even in churches, that will be a reaction when God begins to move. Very often when God begins to move and new people come into the church, do you know what will happen? There will be new people that God brings into the kingdom, and these people are they are just a mess. They've got problems. They've got this. They've got that. You may look at them and you think, hmm, they don't dress the right way for church. And, well, don't they know they should be quiet in church? And all sorts of things. But they're new. And they don't know. There are things that they don't know yet. And that says something about our hearts as to how we respond when God begins to move. Well, in this particular play, can, instance, as the man was healed, oh, there was great rejoicing. Certainly the man was rejoicing, wasn't he? How many of you know the Sunday school song, uh, He went walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. Uh, you know it, as do I. We learned it in Sunday school. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Um, I'll save my voice for preaching instead of singing. Um, and that's the story of this man. And that's exactly describing what happened. But at the same time, all of the authorities were very disturbed by it. They didn't want that happening. They wanted things. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted people to look at them. So what happens to Peter and John? Peter and John are arrested, put in jail, and the next day they're brought before the leaders. Now, before we look at the scripture, I want you to think of something with me about the life of Peter because we know his life well. The old Peter had failed miserably in times of crisis. Yes or no? Yes. yes. In, the, in the courtyard of the high priest, as Jesus was being tried, what did Peter do when the pressure came down on him? What happened? He denied Jesus. In cowardice and in fear, he denied, denied Jesus. But that's not the only time Peter failed. If you go back a few hours before then, Peter failed in the Garden of Gethsemane as well as they came to arrest Jesus. Do you remember what happened at that point? The soldiers came in to arrest Peter, uh, to arrest Jesus, and what did Peter do? He pulled out a sword, and he had murder in his heart, didn't he? He wasn't just looking for a little trim. He had murder in his heart, and he cut off. He thank the Lord that he only cut off an ear <laughs> because he was aiming for a neck, wasn't he? We, and he was a, it's a good thing he was a fisherman and not a soldier. <laughs> so, 
But God, but Jesus could have put a neck back, a head back on too, couldn't he? Because he's because he's Jesus. That really would have been a miracle, wouldn't it? But Jesus picked up the ear, and he put the and he put it back on uh, the the servant of the high priest, uh, Malchus, the servant of the high priest. And I want you to think about that as well, because to me, that's another failure in the life of Peter. Peter, in misplaced courage and anger said, I will defend Jesus. And he did what Jesus did not want him to do. And so we see within the space of a few hours when the pressure came on Peter's life, the old Peter responded the first time in the wrong way, in anger. The second time in the wrong way, in fear. Now, the new Peter, the Peter that has the help of the Holy Spirit. He has been arrested he has been brought before, along with John, he's been brought before the leaders, and this time they say to him, upon whose authority and in whose name have you healed this man? Now let's look at the scripture, Acts 4, 5 through 10. The next day the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of the law, religious law, met in Jerusalem. Who is there? Annas, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. Oh, maybe even the servant of the high priest. We don't know because other relatives and others, the one who had his ear cut off. We don't know, but what we know is this. Peter is standing in front of the very people who condemned Jesus to death. It's the same group. It's the same people. And they demand of him, by who, what power or in whose name have you done this? Now look with me at verse 8, and here's an example of what, we are, of what we're talking about. In the crunch time, in the crisis time, when it's beyond your capacity or your ability, the Holy Spirit is there to help you. Here we go. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wasn't Peter filled with the Holy Spirit that night that we read about in John 20 when Jesus breathed on him and said, receive the Holy Spirit? Yes, Peter received the Holy Spirit then in salvation. Wasn't Peter filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost sometime earlier when the Holy Spirit was poured out, given as a gift from God the Father and God the Son, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues and then preached? Was Peter not filled at that time? Yes, he was. But there are other instances and there are other occasions and there are other crisis times and stretch points in your life and my life when we need the work and the help of the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the one who comes along beside us because it is more than we can do. My personality, my nature, my character is not enough in some circumstances and in some situations and neither is yours. And here is Peter. Before he failed, before he acted rashly and responded in anger, is Peter going to respond in anger this time? wrongly? Or is he going to crumble under the pressure and say, well, you know God. God's a great God and, and God and God did it. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the, Na the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Whew, take a breath. In one long sentence, he's packed a whole sermon, hasn't he? Look at that. One sentence, and he's got it all in that one sentence. The Holy Spirit can help us do what we cannot do in and of ourselves. The Holy Spirit can do and can do what in our lives, what we can't, we, we can't even think about how to do it. And here is Peter, the new Peter, with the empowering and the equipping of the Holy Spirit in a stretch time, in a time when he failed before. But this time, he has the help of the Holy Spirit in a new capacity and in a new dimension. And it says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, and out comes this wonderful proclamation to the glory of God. And I want you to see this this morning because it's not just Peter that receives this type of help 
from the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, you and I are going to face situations and crises and opportunities that are bigger than we are. And it may be a place that you have failed in the past, that you tried and you blew it. But I want to tell you something this morning. The promise of God the Father, the promise of Jesus the Son is that the Holy Spirit is there to help us in the crisis time, in the stretch time, when you are pulled beyond what you can do, when it is something that is greater than your ability, it's greater than your training, it's greater than your education, it's greater than your knowledge, it's greater than your strength. The Holy Spirit is there to help you in those times. And you can't engineer it, and you can't make it happen, but God the Holy Spirit has promised to walk with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And He is with you in the crunch time. He is with you in the crisis time. He is with you in the stretch time. And we see this in the life of Peter in a new dimension. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, that's not Peter. Peter's not that educated. Peter's not that smart. Peter is not that controlled. But the Holy Spirit is. And the Holy Spirit, because He has come into Peter's life in a new dimension, is able to take that opportunity because Peter is there. And the Holy Spirit flows through him and does something special and wonderful. And I want to tell you something this morning. God, the Holy Spirit, is available to you and to me in this dimension if we will let Him if we will give him opportunity. The old Peter could, couldn't, con he couldn't even control what he said. He was always saying things that he shouldn't have said. But the new Peter, controlled by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, God is able to use him in a new way, in a new way. Now I want us to move forward sometime in the early church. And I want us to look at Stephen. Here's a very different situation and a very different circumstance. Stephen is the first martyr of the early church. He was stoned to death. Have you ever thought about being stoned to death? I, I've thought about that before and I thought, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how, I, could, I don't know how I couldn't, how could anyone endure that? Let's look at the life of Stephen. Here's a situation that is so far beyond what any of us could imagine. How could we go through this? How could we, how could we endure this without giving up and without saying, okay, I, 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 I take it back, I take it back. I, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. Yes, I'll be, I'll be a good Jew. I won't, I won't preach in the name of Jesus. How can Stephen do this? He's one of the first deacons of the church, and I invite you, we won't do it this morning because of time, but I invite you to go back and read Acts chapter 6. Stephen is, don't take this the wrong way, board and other people. Stephen is just a deacon. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You understand, don't you? He's just a deacon. He's not the pastor. He's not one of the appointed Bible teachers. He's not even one of the elders of the church. Stephen is a deacon responsible for the business of the church. But the Bible says he was a man full of the Holy Spirit. Do you mean we have to be full of the Holy Spirit to conduct the business of the church? We sure do. That's what the Bible says. We must be. You say, yes, but I've got a lot of ability. I've got a lot of this. The Bible says to conduct the business of the church, we must be full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because He has to control us. It's His church. It's not our church. We're part of what He's doing. And Stephen is a man full of the Holy Spirit. And if you'll read, you will find out that he's also a Acts 6, 8 through 10. He's full of God's grace and power. And look at what happens. He performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. This is Stephen. Why? Because Stephen is so great? No. Because the Holy Spirit is so great in his life. And so all of these wonderful things are happening and opposition rises against him. And look at what happens next. They argue with him, they debate him, but we read that none of them could stand against the wisdom and the what? Spirit, Spirit with which Stephen spoke. God the Holy Spirit in your life and my life will take you beyond your limitations. God the Holy Spirit in your life will take you beyond your ability.
He will take you beyond your education. He will take you beyond your experience if you will let him, if you will depend on him, if you will rely on him. Now, if you want to, and I want to be in control, and if we want to do it ourselves, God the Holy Spirit will let us because he's a gentleman and he doesn't push and he doesn't say, now you let me be in charge. He responds and he moves and he, he works as we invite him and as we open our lives for his work. And we see this picture here. Why was Stephen able to do this? Because he was surrendered to God and the Holy Spirit had his life. So God begins to move and, to, and begins to work. And of course what happens? They can't defeat him in honest ways, and so they send two witnesses to lie against him and say, he blasphemed. Mm. And so he's arrested, and he's brought before the leaders. Now, what happens next? Acts 7, 54 through 56. Stephen begins to preach again. You know what I love about this? This lets me know Stephen really is a man of God. Because if I were arrested and accused falsely, do you know what I would want to do? I'm just being really honest with you. I'm, this is just my thinking. I would want to say, these people are liars. They're not telling the truth about me. I didn't blaspheme against God. I didn't do that. They're lying. They're false. They're, they're, they've been given money to lie about me. And I would have been defending myself. Isn't that kind of what you would want to do too? Yeah, you know. That's how we are. Of course, that's how we are. But God lifts us above that. And Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. And I love this. He takes the opportunity. And what does he do? He does the same thing that Peter did when he was accused. He starts preaching a sermon about God. And he starts lifting up and glorifying God. Because when God, the Holy Spirit, is at work in your life and in my life, do you know who he lifts up? He lifts up Jesus. Do you know who is glorified? He is glorified. I don't, I'm not glorified. I'm not, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're so great. You're so great. No. When the Holy Spirit is in charge of my life, God is glorified. When the Holy Spirit is in charge of your life, God is glorified. And that's when people see God. And so, Peter, and so Stephen begins to preach a sermon. And then I want you to see the response. Look with me. But Steve, they shook their fists at him in rage. Uh, who knows what they were doing? They have the authority and the power to put him to death by stoning. That was the Jewish custom. Uh, that would, the Jewish religious uh, uh, response would have been that. And I want you to see, in the face of enemies that hate him, what does it say? Verse 55. But Stephen, what? full of the Holy Spirit gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand and he told them look I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand now pause with me for just a minute and I want you to think about this those of us that know our Bibles already know how this story ends. And we might say, Pastor Jennifer, this is not such a great example about the Holy Spirit's help at such a time because Stephen was stoned to death. He didn't get out of this one. He was stoned to death. Maybe we should move on to another Bible story. I don't think that's the point. What I want us to see and what I believe the point, one of the points and one of the things we need to understand from this it, from this event is what we see in Stephen. It is not that Stephen faced death, that he didn't escape, that he went to be, that he went to be with the Lord in heaven. I think the point is this. Stephen was surrounded by enemies. He was in a situation so much bigger than he could face. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen was not afraid. Stephen was not in despair. Stephen was not hopeless. Instead, what does it say? Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus. You and I will come to points in our lives when it seems that we will be overwhelmed by trouble, 
We will be overwhelmed by the enemy. We will be overwhelmed by opposition. We will be overwhelmed by the things that I can't control them and I can't do anything about it. And in my natural self and in my own experience and in my own strength, what I will see and what will fill my mind is the trouble, the problem, and my heart will be heavy. And all of us, we have all battled this and we have all struggled with this and we've all faced this. What am I going to do about this? And our minds are weighed down with the problem and with the trouble. And brothers and sisters, it is in such a time that you need, again, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the help of the Holy Spirit in the crisis time, in the crunch time, when it is beyond your capacity. You cannot control the situation. You cannot change the situation. You can't change yourself. You can't change the person. You can't change anything. But when the Holy Spirit helps you at a time like this, He can help you lift your eyes above the problem. Lift your eyes above the difficulty. The problem doesn't go away. The problem hasn't changed. But you can see Jesus and the glory of God in that situation. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's not just for Stephen. It's not just for Peter. This is the promise of God in your life and in my life. Because we live in a world where we will face troubles. We live in a world where there will be big problems. We live in a world where things happen that, oh, under other circumstances, it would crush us. But be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive God's help, God the Holy Spirit's help in these times, that He will lift your gaze. And it won't just be, oh God, oh God. It will be, I, I see this word, see this word. He gazed steadily into heaven. And when God the Holy Spirit fills your life and you receive His help in this way, your feet will be steadfast upon the rock and you will not be shaken and you will be able to gaze steadily, steadily into heaven and you will not be shaken. You will not be destroyed. You will not be knocked off your feet. You're not strong enough. You're not powerful enough. You're, you don't know the Bible enough. But the Holy Spirit will do this. And the Holy Spirit can do this in your life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in the crisis time, in the crunch time, in the pressure time. Our time is, is, is gone. There's one more that I want you just to think about very quickly. And it's in Acts 13. And you can just turn there if you want to. But I encourage you... As we come to a close, I encourage you to read this on your own. And this is the story of Paul as he goes with Barnabas on the first missionary journey. And it's in Acts 13, 6 through 8. And he's going with Barnabas. They're on the island of Cyprus. He's preaching the gospel throughout the island. And then they reach the capital city of Paphos. And in Paphos, there are two men. And both men are powerful. Both men are influential. And one of the men is Jewish, and one of them is a Roman. And one wants to hear the gospel, and one is opposing the gospel. And this story you know very well. And Paul and Barnabas, they're Sergius Paulus, he's the governor. And he's an intelligent man, and he invites Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. And then there's Elimus, the sorcerer, or Bar-Jesus. How ironic. Do you know what bar means? Son of Jesus. That's right. Son of Jesus. That's what it means. Son of Jesus. But as we see, instead, he was a son of the devil, wasn't he? Because he was opposing the work of God. And he interfered and he urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul were saying. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Now, I want you to look at this and think about this. Who sent Paul and Barnabas? Because from this point onward, right there, See that right there? From then on, he's called Paul. That's where you see it for the first time. Saul, also known as Paul. They were sent out. The church agreed with the Holy Spirit and laid hands on them and prayed for them. But they were on this mission because God the Holy Spirit had said, Go. Okay? 
and this is still part of what we're talking about. God the Holy Spirit said, do this. God the Holy Spirit said, go. And they go, and there's opposition. They go, and here comes, he's a sorcerer. He's a false prophet. Does he have power? Yes, he has power. The enemy has power. And the enemy will oppose. When you respond in obedience to God and do what he's called you to do, go where he's called you to go, and live as he's called you to live. There will be opposition. There will be attacks against your life, against your ministry, and against the work that God has called you to do. And what happens? Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye, and he says, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that's good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? And then he pronounces the judgment of God. It's not Paul. Paul's not saying, I curse you, you are blind. It's not Paul. Look at what's, look at what's going on here. He pronounces the judgment of the Lord. And what I want us to see here is this. Immediately, Elimus goes blind for a short time. Well, that's the grace of God even, isn't it? He could have blinded him for forever. But for a short time he was blind. And look at the response. We get excited about, whoa, Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and he pronounced blindness? That's not the point. What's the point? The point is, when God sent Paul out to do his work, then he was under the guidance and he was under the control of the Holy Spirit and it was God's work, not Paul's work. It was God's calling, not Paul's calling. And when opposition came, what happens? God the Holy Spirit takes care of opposition. And I want us to see as we close this morning, when the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. But what brought it about? We just read it. Paul, full of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit at that minute. And what I want you to see is this this morning. Brothers and sisters, God has called you. God has called you. There are places that you and I are to go. There are people that God wants us to speak to. And there will be opposition. And there will be difficulties. But I want to say to you this morning, do not be afraid to go. When God calls you, do not be afraid to speak when God says speak. Now some of you are saying, yes, yes, yes. But Pastor Jen, um, let me prepare first. Let me, let me get ready first. And after I'm prepared, then I will go do what God wants me to do. And I will say what God wants me to say. If you wait until you, are, until you feel you are prepared, let me tell you what will happen. You will never go. You will never speak. You will never do. But God is touching our hearts. And God is dealing with us. And I know this morning, God has worked in your hearts and lives. And there are many of you here this morning. God has put a stirring in your heart. And you know it's God, but you're afraid. You know it's God, but you think, I'm not prepared. You know it's God, but you feel the opposition will be too difficult. How can I do this? Let me get prepared first. If you wait to be prepared, you're not going to do it. Oh, I, I am so glad that Palian and Lao went to Sichuan. Were you a little bit scared? <laughs> Lao says, <laughs> yes, I was scared. Were you fully prepared? <laughs> no, but God the Holy Spirit in the stretch time, in the stretch time, He provides what is needed. He provides what is necessary for His work because it's God's calling. When Pastor Renee and Trevor and Pauline went to the Northwest, did they have a translator? didn't have a translator. Was this your own idea or did God say go? God said go. And what happened? God provided what was needed. When God says go, you go. When God says do, you do. When God says speak, you speak. Why? Because you are great and big? No. Because God, the Holy Spirit, is promised you in the stretch time, in the crisis time, in the situation that is bigger than you, His help is available. His help is available. And I agree and I say amen again to what Pastor Renee said earlier. I believe God is stirring us and leading us and preparing us for 
more open doors and for outreach in the days and in the months and in this year ahead. And if God is doing it, and I believe He is, I felt this in my heart before I said anything to anyone. Pastor Renee felt it before he said anything to anyone. And then this brother said, I believe God is this. I want to tell you something. Uh, to me, that's the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. That's the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you in all of these areas, whether it is trouble you are facing and you think, how can I overcome? Or whether it's a situation like Peter's or like Paul's, I challenge you and I encourage you. And we're going to close in prayer this morning. Let's just go ahead and just close your eyes this morning. And I want to pray God's blessing upon you this morning. If you will receive the help of the Holy Spirit, He is available to you for the crunch time for the crisis time, for the stretch time, when you think, I can't stretch anymore. I have been as kind as I can to this person. I just want to punch them. I can't, I can't, ha I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand it. Yes, you can. Why? You've got the Holy Spirit. God, we come to you this morning. We thank you so much. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you poured out long ago and you continue to pour out upon your people today. Oh God, we thank you for the ongoing gift and helping and equipping and empowering of the Holy Spirit in the times when we think, God, I can't do this. And God, you say, I know you can't do it, but I've given you the Holy Spirit and you will do it. You will do it. Oh Lord, help us not to be timid people. Lord, help us not to be cowardly people waiting until, well, when it's right, I'll do it. Lord, help us not to just wait and wait and wait until we're finally, oh, I'm, I'm prepared and now I can do it. Oh God, I pray, help us to be people full of your Holy Spirit, full of your Holy Spirit, willing to go. And Lord, we're not talking about acting rashly and just jumping out and doing this or that, but Lord, help us to be people who hear your voice and respond to your voice. When you say go, we will go. When you say do, we will do. Lord, when you say speak, oh God, help us to speak and to trust that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you will provide, God, what is lacking in our lives, what is lacking in our speech, Lord, what is lacking in our ability and our capacity. Oh God, oh God, I thank you for the stretching times. Lord, I thank you for the crisis times because God, that's when we see that you are a great God and you give your Holy Spirit to keep us in those times, to empower us in those times, to equip us in those times for your your glory and for your work. Oh God, may your Holy Spirit, Lord, may, may your Holy Spirit be especially poured out upon your people in this day and in the days ahead. God, I pray for those that are facing problems that think that are almost crushed and they think, God, I can't take it anymore and I, I just can't. Oh God, oh God, may they receive the help of your Holy Spirit today as they are being stretched. Oh Lord, instead, oh God, of looking at it as I'm going to be broken, instead, oh God, may they see your hand stretching them to receive more of you in a greater capacity. Lord, in a greater measure. Oh God, oh God, Lord, for those of us that feel the stirring in our hearts, you have been dealing with us. You have been stirring our hearts that you can, that there's more, Lord, that you want more from us, that there, is, there are greater things. Lord, I pray that your people would be willing to go forth and to step out in faith, in faith, Lord, not in reckless abandon, but Lord, in faith that you are calling and where you guide, you will provide and where you call, you will empower. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May your people, may your people receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that you have promised that Jesus and you said we will send we will send oh Lord oh Lord we thank you we thank you for your blessings for your giftings for your promises that and you do not lie that are fulfilled in our lives hallelujah we thank you God for the reports that we've heard from Xinjiang this week we thank you God we thank you God for that's an example of what we've been talking about this morning Lord we thank you of what we're hearing from Sichuan Lord we thank you about what we're hearing from the Philippines oh God we know if the world looks at us they would say who are you and what are you and what type of degree do you have but oh God we will be your people we will be your people 
and we will answer your call, hallelujah, in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Don't be afraid. Don't hold back. Go. Speak. And do. Amen.